Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. The what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examinations perspective. So today we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 5th February 2023 and some of the important topics from the Indian Express explains section of the last week. So now let us begin our today's session. This topic deals with mangroves. This topic has appeared in today's the Hindu Delhi edition in the relation of the union budget for 2023 to 2024. So in the previous DNS also when we discussed the key highlights and features of the budget 23 to 24 we discussed one important program or the scheme which was known as Mishti scheme. This Mishti scheme stood for mangroves initiative for shoreline habitats and tangible incomes. The main aim of this scheme was for the preservation and conservation of mangroves so in that session we restricted our discussion to the key facts related to this particular scheme but in today's session we are dealing with the overall topic of mangroves and that is why this topic when it comes to the upsc scheme of syllabus is primarily relevant for gs paper 3 because in that section we have environment and biodiversity as important component so that is why in today's session we will be discussing various dimensions associated with the mangroves ecosystem so first of all what are mangroves mangroves are basically salt tolerant species these species are found mainly in tropical regions as well as the subtropical regions moreover as far as the topography or the basic land conditions are concerned these species are found in the intertidal zones now what do you mean by intertidal areas or intertidal zones from the basic knowledge of the oceanography we understand that there are two types of tidal lines one is the low tide line and one is the high tide line for example suppose this is the land topography and then here we have the presence of oceans so there will be one point below which there is a perpetual presence of oceans this is the low tide line that means even during the low tides the water towards land will be reaching at this particular point but then there will be certain high tide lines that whenever we are facing the high tide situations the water will further encroach landward and will reach up to this area so the region between the high tide line and the low tide line on the land is known as the intertidal region these mangrove species are mainly found in these areas okay so first we are dealing with the basic concepts related to the mangroves ecosystems now these mangrove systems are very important because they act as bio shields against extreme climatic events for example they act as shield or shock absorber during tropical cyclones they also reduces the intensity of the flow of the ocean water during tsunamis so that means that these mangroves ecosystem acts like shock absorbers and bio shields against extreme climatic events as far as the distribution of mangroves in india is concerned because now we understand that mangroves are restricted to the intertidal zone and hence they will be mainly found in the coastal areas so that is why in india in nine states as well as three union territories we find the presence of mangroves mangroves are present on the west coast as well as on the east coast moreover mangroves are also found at both the island regions mangroves are there in andaman and nicobar islands as well as in the lakshadweep islands so this is the geographical distribution of mangroves when it comes to india Now, according to the latest report of State of World Mangroves 2022, the total mangrove cover of the world is around one lakh forty-seven thousand square kilometer, and out of this, around one and a half lakh square kilometer, around five thousand square kilometers are found in India. now here the important fact is that this particular report that is state of the world mangroves 2022 report is published by global mangrove alliance now in the beginning we discussed that 
mangroves are basically the salt tolerant species and they are found at the intertidal regions now an important question should come into your mind is that these are the regions which face harsh conditions the reason being that these areas are almost always waterlogged if they are waterlogged conditions then the natural soil in that area which supports the vegetation will be lacking in the oxygen content but we all know that plants require the oxygen content because their roots require oxygen for respiration processes so the question should come into the mind that how these species are salt tolerant how these species develop the mechanism which make them suitable to grow in such harsh areas so there are two or three basic concepts related to it one is the breathing roots system second is the silt roots and third is vivi pras nature so now we will discuss these three terms that what do you understand by these three terms and how they help the mangroves to get developed in these regions these breathing roots are also known as nematophores so what are these let us understand this for example this is a crop and this is the land surface and here are the roots of this particular crop correct now when the soil below this land surface is permanently filled with water the voids in these soil particles lack oxygen or the air content and hence these roots will not be able to get the oxygen which they require that is why normally in waterlogged conditions there are very rare plants but when it comes to the mangroves in order to cope up this particular thing they develop the breathing roots ecosystem these breathing roots are basically the roots which are above the land surface they are needle like structures which come out of the land surface so these roots have numerous pores through which oxygen enters into the underground tissues so they take the oxygen from the atmosphere and then through these pores they get to the underground structure and hence reaches the roots and which then gets transported to the plants so these are the nematophores and because these roots are taking oxygen from the atmosphere they are also known as breathing roots now what are silt roots in some mangrove species the roots diverge from the stem and branches and penetrate the soil some distance away from the main stem for example let's say again if this is the plant this is the land surface so the roots of these plants get away from the stem and then they enter into the ground you can understand this structure by imagining the banyan tree because of their appearance and because they provide the main physical support to these they are called as silt roots now why these roots are important because these mangrove vegetation are continuously exposed to fast moving waters of the oceans or the seas and that is why this support system that is silt roots make them physically strong to withstand the pressure of the water in the oceans and the seas so the breathing roots solve the problems of low oxygen in the soil silt roots resolve the issues of the hydraulic pressure which is created by the ocean or the sea water the third thing is five way peri nature so the saline water unconsolidated saline soils with little or no oxygen is not conducive environment for seeds to germinate and establish to overcome this mangrove species have unique way of reproduction which is generally known as five way peri in this method of reproduction the seeds germinate and develop into seedlings while the seeds are still attached to the parent trees these seedlings are normally called as propagules and they photosynthesize while still attached to the mother tree the parent tree supplies water and necessary nutrients they are buoyant and float in the water for some time before rooting themselves on the suitable soil so basically viviparous nature solves the issues of germination and reproduction and that is how these three mechanisms help the mangrove vegetation to grow and sustain in these harsh conditions also but these mangrove ecosystems nowadays are facing several threats for example they are facing 
polluted waters which are being discharged from the industries they are also facing a huge agricultural load then in the name of eco tourism these mangrove species are facing high demographic loads and in order to build this tourism industry they are also experiencing they are also experiencing creation of physical infrastructure further aquaculture or fisheries along the coasts are obstructing the tidal flows which is one of the biggest threats to the mangrove ecosystems also the discharge of the untreated domestic waters which enter into the rivers further impede the natural intertidal flow along the coasts and mixing of fresh water and saline water so these are the major threats which our mangrove ecosystems are facing and these threats become more important given the fact when the same report that is the state of world mangroves 2022 reports says that mangroves are estimated to hold up to four times the amount of carbon as some other ecosystem store similarly it also says that just the loss of even 1% of the remaining mangroves could lead to the loss of around 0.23 gigatons of co2 equivalent that means that if we destroy the mangrove ecosystems so the carbon equivalent which these vegetations were storing in themselves will get released and will further lead to the increase in the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and this will develop a positive feedback system which again will trigger the climate change so that is why the budget 2023 to 2024 which we discussed in the beginning has come up with this mishti program and the budget states that mishti will be implemented through the convergence between mg narega kampa fund and other sources further the local communities will also be involved in order to protect the mangroves ecosystem in india's coastal areas next topic is indus water treaty the major contentious issue between india and pakistan This topic regularly appears in newspapers more often but the immediate context for this news item which has appeared in Indian Express explain section is that recently India has sent a notice to the state of Pakistan in relation to the Indus water treaty this notice has been seen as a response to the Pakistan's recent disregard related to the mechanism to resolve the dispute related to India's run of the river hydroelectricity projects like Kishan Ganga and Rattle Dam project so that is why this topic becomes important for the upsc examinations perspective and that is why on a today's session we will be dealing with the basic dimensions related to the indus water treaty that what exactly was the indus water treaty what are the issues therein what can be the suggestions and this we will learn with the help of map but before coming to the treaty first we will look at that what was the background in which this treaty was negotiated It was in 1948 when an interdominion accord was signed between India and Pakistan whereby it was said that India will provide the waters of the Indus and its tributaries to Pakistan and in lieu of this Pakistan will give the annual payment to India first of all we we'll look at the rivers its tributaries and its geography between India and Pakistan Now this is broadly the Indus and its tributaries the Indus river originates in Tibet travels through the Himalayas and the Karakoram ranges of India and then finally enters into Pakistan Now the important rivers in this particular area is the first the major river that is the Indus then we have Jhelum Chenab Ravi Bias and Satluj So from north to south you need to memorize this order of these rivers Indus Jhelum Chenab Ravi Bias Satluj Now because India is the upstream country of these rivers that is why it was the responsibility of India to provide the waters to the downstream country that is Pakistan But soon this accord failed and that is why in 1951 both the countries went to the World Bank to financially assist them in order to support the irrigation projects in this particular area. In continuation of this 
the indus water treaty was negotiated between both the countries the important features of the indus water treaty is that there was a division between the western and the eastern rivers the indus jhelum and chenab were considered as the western rivers and ravi bias and satluj were considered as the eastern rivers pakistan was granted the right of unrestricted usage over the western rivers that is indus jhelum and chenab similarly india was granted the right of unrestricted usage over three rivers that is ravi bias and satluj so this means that around 80% of the total water went to pakistan and 20% of the total water went to india the second important thing was india was also allowed to have a minimum storage level on the western rivers that is indus jhelum and chenab this was done in order to promote the water conservation and flood management systems the next thing was the permanent indus commission was to be set up by both the countries and this commission was set up in order to exchange the information regarding these rivers plus it was also to act as the first point of dispute settlement in case it arises further india was allowed to have run of the river hydro projects these are smaller hydro projects which do not have the live storage levels they just use the kinetic energy of the rivers and function as the hydroelectric projects the last important thing was related to the dispute resolution the three stage process was established the dispute at the first stage will be resolved at the commission that is the indus water commission or bilaterally at the intergovernmental levels if the dispute remains unresolved the second stage was the appointment of the neutral experts by the world bank the countries can go to world bank and then the world bank can appoint a neutral expert even if at the second stage the issue is not resolved the both the countries at the third stage can go to the court of arbitration so these were the key features of the indus water treaty however there are certain issues in this treaty also the first and the major issue is that the demand for water is growing in both the countries because of the rise in population developmental aspirations urbanization and industrialization the water demand is growing at an exponential rate the second major issue was the pakistan objection to the kishan ganga hydroelectric project now kishan ganga is a tributary of the jhelum river and because india was building a dam over the kishan ganga pakistan feared that this could mean the increased water storage capacity for india under this treaty when india was allowed to establish run of the river hydro projects it was also laid down that all the design specifications will be shared by its counterpart that is pakistan too and in case pakistan feels that the design requirements are not respecting the treaty then it can raise the objections so in this very line the pakistan raised the objection over the kishan ganga hydroelectric project and india agreed to lower its height from 97 to 37 meters similarly pakistan has also objected on the salal project as well as the baglihar projects further the annual meeting of the permanent commission has been suspended due to terror activities such as uri and pulwama where india threatened pakistan of stopping the water flow further as we have discussed that treaty does provide with the third party intervention and arbitration but the mode is quite weak and the suitable results are least expected so these were some of the major issues in this treaty which you must be aware of so after this whole discussion there are some important points which must be understood in order to critically analyze the various issues which are involved in this particular treaty first is that despite the increasing demand of water india has underutilized the waters of western rivers for the irrigation purposes although the treaty has stood the test of time but iwt was framed based on the knowledge and technology existing at that point of time when the agreement was signed but since then a lot of changes have occurred in terms of knowledge technology as well as diplomatic levels 
and that is why this treaty must be reformed to suit the present scenario perspective of both the nations at that point of time was confined to the river management and usage of water through the construction of dams barrages canals and hydro power generation but now in today's discussion also we have pointed it out that the scenario has changed present day the issues like climate change global warming environmental impact assessment etc should be considered by this treaty further the government should examine the feasibility of making the maximum use of provisions of the iwt in terms of full utilization of all accessible water on the eastern rivers and maximum utilization of irrigation and hydropower potential of the western rivers this topic is in relation to the great indian bustard one of the very important wildlife species when it comes to the indian context this topic has appeared in today's the hindu daily edition in the context that recently a supreme court appointed committee has recommended that in order to protect the endangered great indian bustards the power lines in thar and kutch region of rajasthan and gujarat should be rerouted or made to go underground so in this very regard we shall discuss certain key facts related to the great indian bustard as far as the syllabus is concerned this topic finds its relevant when it comes to the ecology section more importantly this topic because it's factual in nature and is related to the particular wildlife species so this topic is mainly relevant from the prelims examination perspective so now let us look at certain key facts related to this particular species so as we all know that great indian bustard is one of the largest flying birds in the world but for last few years their population has been declining at a very alarming rate and that is why they have entered into the critically endangered category as far as the iucn red list is concerned the major reasons for their decline in population is first the loss of habitat due to higher demographic load agriculture as well as infrastructure development second is these great indian bustards are low height flying species and that is why many a times during their flight they come in contact with the electricity transmission lines third there are several stray dogs which are known to attack the bustards egg and the young ones so these are the three primary reasons for the decline of great indian bustards population as far as the distribution is concerned these species were formerly widespread across india and pakistan however at present its population is estimated to be of less than 200 across rajasthan gujarat maharashtra mp karnataka and andhra pradesh so another important pattern out of all these states are the, that these great indian bustards are mainly found in semi arid areas as far as the protected areas of these in india is concerned there are five important areas first is in the state of rajasthan which is the desert national park second in gujarat where there lies a nalia sanctuary in kutch third is madhya pradesh where there is karera wildlife sanctuary coming to maharashtra there we have nannaj grasslands and in andhra pradesh where we have rola paddu wildlife sanctuary so this shows the distribution of great indian bustards in various protected areas across these different states now coming to the conservation status as we have discussed first that they are critically endangered species as far as iucn red list is concerned and critically endangered species commands highest degree of severity of vulnerability as far as the india's wildlife protection act 1972 is concerned this species is obviously in schedule 1 further as far as the sites is concerned this species is listed in appendix 1 this bird is also declared as the state bird of rajasthan so these were the key facts related to the great indian bustards our last topic is pm vikas scheme this scheme has been launched in this year's budget that is 23 to 24's budget this scheme is very important and it also deals with a very interesting topic largely marginalized and we do not see the contributions of these people in our regular lives 
or I would like to say that we see their contributions but we somehow fail to recognize their contributions. And these people are traditional artisans like carpenters, iron smiths, goldsmiths, potters, sculptors, etc. To improve their livelihood, the government this year has come up with PM Vikas Scheme, which stands for Prime Minister Vishwakarma Kaushal Samman. This scheme overall deals with training, technology, credit, and market support for such people. There are certain key focus areas, for example, like increasing the caliber of the artisan, that is, human resource development, and to enhance the market accessibility for the goods which these people make. How this has to be done? This is to be done by putting these people, integrating these people into the MSME value chain and providing the financial support to these artisans as well. We have discussed that skills and training, that is human resource part, forms the core component of this very scheme. And that is why skills and training programs for the traditional and age-old crafts will be conducted. People will be encouraged to learn the art. We all know that in the present era of digitization and technological advancements, somehow these traditional skills are being ignored. The new generation is not taking up these skills and the primary reason for this is that we as the consumers are not also recognizing the importance of these skills, the products or the goods which they make. Moreover then, there are several challenges, for example, lack of integration with modern technological systems, lack of market accessibility, higher costs, etc. This scheme further aims to employ the latest technology and the associated training programs. Artisans will be taught to use the latest technologies to increase their productivity, but this is to be done without disturbing the traditional practices involved in the craft making. They will also be introduced to the paperless payment system and the government will also try to enhance their market accessibility beyond our domestic boundaries also. That is, government will try to tap the potential of these international markets as well because still there is a very huge demand of traditional products in the foreign markets. So again, PM Vikas Keep remember this thing that this Vikas is for the Vikas of the Vishwakarmas and these Vishwakarmas are our traditional artisans. Now this topic is mainly relevant from the prelims examinations perspective. Despite the fact that this topic is important from the context of Sri Lanka's economic situation, how when it comes to the prelims examination because we know that every year around one to two questions are asked from the international groupings or organizations, their name or their mandate. So that is why under this session, we are dealing with one such organization which is known as Paris Club. The immediate context of this very news article is that as all of you know that Sri Lanka is going through economic crisis and it requires a bailout for which it has approached the IMF. But according to the present norms and conditions, IMF requires certain assurances from the countries who have given the loan to Sri Lanka and in this case which we are discussing there are three countries which are important one is China second is Japan and third is India so IMF requires the assurances from these three major creditors who have given the credit to Sri Lanka now Japan is the member of Paris Club and they were to give certain assurances to IMF so that it can provide a bailout. However, before China and Japan, India came forward and it gave its assurance. It entered into a bilateral negotiation with Sri Lanka and decided that what it wants to do. And obviously this has hurt the diplomatic interests of China. Moreover, Japan, because is a member of Paris Club, the interests of Paris Club also come into play. Now, we are not required to understand the legalities of this particular case. However, because this particular organization has come into news, so just from the preliminary examinations perspective, we should know that who are its important members and what is the mandate of Paris Club, that what does it actually do? So first of all, it was founded in 1956 and its secretariat is located in Paris. That's why the name 
Paris Club. Now, Paris Club is a group of official creators, and as you will see, that most of the members of this organization are the Western, that is, developed countries. This group consists of nine countries plus the European Union, and this organization provides the debt restructuring and relief to the developing countries facing financial difficulties, which in this case is Sri Lanka. The role of this organization is to find coordinated and sustainable solutions to the payment difficulties experienced by debtor countries. As the debtor countries undertake reforms to stabilize and restore their macroeconomic situations, the Paris Club creditors provide an appropriate debt treatment. Now, it operates under the auspices of OECD, that is Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This map, this green color region, shows the members of the Paris Club. The important members include France, Germany, Japan, United Kingdom, US, Canada, Brazil, Australia, etc. So, this was a factual topic from the examination perspective. You must know that what is Paris Club, who are its members. India is not the member of Paris Club. And what is the broader mandate that what does this organization actually do?